High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you are around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I am offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. Visit their website, isaacone.org, I-A-S-I-C-1.org to follow the science on marijuana. Hey there, High Truth listeners. I'm excited to be with you again for a science-based episode. I'm your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. There is so much out there in medical claims about everything. How does anyone decide what's true and what's not in terms of medical information? So I have three tips for you. Number one, beware. Every medicine, every drug has side effects or adverse reactions. Everything. If you are reading only about how great a drug is, then you're not getting the whole picture. There are risks to everything. People who are marketing a drug will toot the benefits and may hide the risks. Number two, trust the FDA labels. Whatever you think about the FDA, it's the best system in the world for drug safety. For a drug to become FDA approved, it must go through rigorous testing. The results of this testing is the basis of the long, fine print, packet insert found in medications that nobody really reads. But to learn about THC, for example, if you want to really know what the FDA says about THC, the psychoactive compound of marijuana, see what the FDA says. Look up FDA label for Marinol, the FDA approved THC, and the research is there in black and white for studies of THC up to 10 milligrams, a low dose. The warnings include neuropsychiatric effects, hemodynamic instability, seizures, and paradoxical nausea and vomiting, or what I call scrometing. Based on the FDA warning, I can tell people that underlying people with underlying mental illness or at risk for mental illness should not be using THC. To learn more about CBD and what the FDA research says, look up the FDA label for Epidiolex, the FDA-approved CBD, pure CBD product, and the warning label for pure, pure, low-dose potency CBD includes hepatocellular disease, somnolence, sedation, and suicidal behavior. Based on the FDA warning, I can tell people that who are taking CBD on a regular basis, they should check their liver functions on a regular basis as well. I will include a link to the FDA labels, in the High Truth show notes. My third tip is check for drug interactions. There are many drugs that have drug interactions and they can cancel the effect of your medications or make your medicine more potent. Use the drug interaction checker on drugs.com and check for interactions between your prescription medicines and other drugs that you may be taking. There are over 500 medications that interact with CBD and over 300 drugs that interact with THC. Knowing the risks as well as the advertised benefits allows you, the public, to make informed decisions. And with that, let's hear our question of the day. Hello, Mr. Berenson. I think your book, Tell Your Children, is simply fantastic. My name is Devin Versace, and as a result of your book, I have decided to form the National Cannabis Candy Band Coalition 
we seek to ban the commercial manufacture, sale, and distribution of any and all drug-laced candy, confectionaries, beverages, and foodstuffs. I think Dr. Lev's show is fantastic, and I have one simple question. In the wake of the Uvalde shooting, isn't it high time that we begin to correlate the mass murders with shooters who also happen to be very heavy daily users of cannabis. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. We will ask Alex Berenson your question. Alex is a journalist who worked for the New York Times before turning to crime novels and is author of 12 John Wells novels. His wife is a forensic psychiatrist and her experience led Alex to write the book Tell Your Children, a nonfiction about the science of cannabis and mental illness. Alex's other claim to fame is being canceled by Twitter. He was not following the federal narrative on the coronavirus and was shut down. You can find Alex Berenson's bio on the High Truth show notes. Alex Berenson, welcome to High Truths. Hi, Dr. Love. Um, we met a few years ago at a Red Ribbon event where you were the keynote speaker and um, it, it was easy to spot you. You were like the tallest one in the room. Uh, <laughs> yeah, People think I'm small because I'm a reporter. So people tend to think reporters are short and then they see me and uh, they tell me that I am taller than they expected. I say I, I have a height in lieu of a personality, which might or might not be true. Right. And now with the, you know, everything on Zoom, say your your height doesn't show. But I do right. I do want my audience and our high truth listeners to get to know you. You started out your career as a reporter about very fun spy novels. I really enjoyed this Deceivers, the last one that I read. <laughs> and um and now now you're considered a rebel. <laughs> Were you always a hidden rebel as a kid? Um and now you kind of made it to the big leagues? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I was a rebel as a kid. I, I guess I've been a contrarian for a long time. Um, uh, and, you know, reporters, I think, I think good reporters tend to be contrarians. Uh, you tend to want to ask difficult questions. Uh, you know, I, I often, you know, when I worked at the New York Times, I thought, well, there's really two kinds of reporters. You can be an inside reporter or an outside reporter. And there's actually room for both, uh, you know, where an inside reporter is somebody who sort of convinces you know, powerful people that you should talk to me. I'm going to get your side out. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sort of present you in a good light. I was never good at doing that. Um, I was an outside reporter. I like to, I like to sort of get to stuff that I thought people didn't want me to write about at all. And uh, to find that, whether it's through documents or whistleblowers or however. And, um, and I didn't really like political reporting that much because, uh, you know, I think in political reporting, there's this sort of basic dishonesty where, and it's changed, you know, in the last few years, Donald Trump has certainly changed reporting a lot, where, you know, you, it was one side and the other, and um, and you had to, you had to sort of go on the assumption or pretend that people weren't just concerned with power and money, whereas business reporting, it was okay for businesses to make money, that's sort of the point of business, as long as they didn't break the law, as long as they didn't uh, you know, do something wrong. So what I was looking for were businesses that were outside the lines. And, um, and that's where I did most of my reporting at the New York Times and before. And, um, uh, you know, I left reporting in 2010, I became the spy novelist, um, which was very interesting for a number of years. Uh, and then uh, I came back to reporting uh, when I wrote Tell Your Children, um, and, and, you know, that was certainly a contrarian book about cannabis and its possible mental health effects. And then, you know, in the last couple of years, I think I've been known for being a contrarian on COVID. Um, you know, again, not that COVID is not real, not that, the, uh, not that it has not killed a large number of people, but that the lockdowns probably were ineffective and that the vaccines, um, you know, have had a lot of issues around them that we haven't really talked about. Uh, and, and, and honestly, all of that, I mean, all of my more recent reporting, I would say, comes out of my reporting as a drug industry reporter for The Times, because what it taught me, uh, what, what, what that experience taught me was you really need to read scientific papers with a, with, a, with a very strong sense of skepticism and be willing to challenge scientists the same way you would challenge business leaders or political leaders. And know that they have biases and know that, you know, they may be motivated by money. Not that they always are, 
but that you should question them. And that certainly the legalization of cannabis has been driven by a couple of things that when you look hard at them don't seem to be true. And then with COVID, where the stakes are even larger, um, that the issues around masks or lockdowns or now vaccines, um, some of the stuff that, that we've been told, you know, is sort of scientific truth isn't necessarily. So I don't know if that makes me a rebel or a contrarian or a skeptic or a truther. I just know that um, I, I, I know that I like to read the documents myself. Well, you're you're the my only guest who's ever been canceled by Twitter. So I'm like <laughs> I'm excited about that. I like your claim to fame. So we have to <laughs> um and uh it'll be we'll we'll come to that. Your your book, um, tell your children. I read your book, um, and I think you deserve uh, a PhD for your research on on that. Because I mean people have done PhD with less research and the way you you put it all together but you put it not in a boring PhD thesis. You put it in a way that's really nice to to read and understand to the lay people. So I, I just want to grant you that PhD, at least from that the University of Ronit Lev. Uh, well, th- I think- well, I mean, thank you. That's what my <laughs> wife says. Actually, she says, she says that really, in a way, the book is a is sort of a PhD thesis, and there is some original research in there too. Um, and you know, it is it is funny because academics are tend to be very uh, credentialist. And, uh, you know, and I don't have a PhD. I don't have any kind of advanced degree. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a credentialist. I, I think I've become less of a credentialist over the years. Um, but, it, but you know, there's some part of me that still feels good to hear you say that. Yeah, definitely. And I could tell you, because I did something else in a boring way. I created this, when I was at ONDCP, I created a bibliography of marijuana that included a lot of research. And then now I created the medical library for Isaac, the International Academy on Science and Impact. They're sponsors of this show. So I have, when I was reading your book, it's like, oh, I know that study. I know that study. But, you know, so I, but I, I had yep, it yep. like kind of outlined in this, in the, in in a different way. You, you, you gave it a story. You gave that science life, you know. Yes. Thank um, you. So Wikipedia, you know, I looked you up on Wikipedia. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> um, they, when I looked up the name of the book, it says, you are an alarmist, promote inaccuracies and inappropriate conclusions. Whoa. Um, well, I so, yeah, I mean, like so Wikipedia, Wikipedia, I mean, it's, it's actually a real problem, um, which I try to ignore because I can't do anything about it. You know, it's viewed as a sort of neutral source. That's like the Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that. In fact, Wikipedia is essentially this left-leaning website that is controlled by a bunch of people um, who who write what they like. And on controversial topics, if you try to edit, they will they will edit it right back. And if there's a fight that goes back and forth, they'll essentially lock the page and kick out anybody who's trying to write something that they don't like. So my personal page, and I and really I try not to do this, but I know that for a while my personal page said I was a conspiracy theorist and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, But, you know, there's, I, I've sort of, because I understand that this is a rigged game with Wikipedia, I'm not doing anything about it right now. There may come a point when I try to, you know, take more decisive action, but because I know that, that it's very, very hard to change, I'm not touching it. Um, Once you know this about Wikipedia, I don't use Wikipedia very much anymore. And I think people who understand the problems with it don't use it. But I think there's a lot of people out there who do use it. And um, it's so and easy. So, so it's unfortunate. Yeah, it, it is. I know. It's like, a, uh, yeah, that was like, usually I look at stuff and it's like, well, you know, it tends to be fair. But that that was one where I thought no, it was very if you, For example, if you want to know like what the largest bridge in, you know, in North America is, Wikipedia is good for that. For example, you know, if if you want something that's like essentially factual, but if you want to read about like Israel and Palestine or me or Donald Trump or anything that's really political, it's a like it, it is extremely political. Yeah. So Devin Versace has a question for you. He he is one of your fan clubs. He was very inspired um, by your book. And his question to you is, is it time in the wake of the Uvalde shooting 
to collect the data in a scientific matter about mass shooters and regular cannabis use. Like we do that for gun violence. Um, uh, shouldn't we be doing that for heavy cannabis use? That's a known, you know, psychoactive I mean, I mean, chemical. I think, I think you can collect it. I think it's pretty hard to draw any conclusions, honestly, because the sample size is so small and, the, and there's so many factors that lead into mass shootings. And frankly, it's interesting. Tell your children suddenly is back in the news. Fox has talked about it the last few weeks and it's sold a bunch of copies. Um, and I've gotten emails about it, and w- which, which, you know, which is gratifying because the book's three and a half years old. And it's nice to know that people are still aware of it and talking about it. However, I will say that the cynic in me is aware that, you know, on some level, the right has glommed onto this issue as a way to avoid talking about gun control, or at least to, you know, take the attention off gun control. I think there's an issue with cannabis and violence. Okay, I think there's an issue with cannabis and psychosis and violence. You, you know this if you've read the book. I, or I practice think, in the ER. <laughs> what's that? Or if you or practice, practice in the, in the ER, emergency. that's right. <laughs> or, you know, have a family member who smoked too much. Um, uh, but I think the mass shooting thing is is hard to draw conclusions about because it's such a small sample size. And and frankly, I think the Uvalde case uh, at this point is, is a lot more... Um, it's a lot more gray than some other cases that have happened recently where there, where there seems to be a stronger connection. Um, uh, you know, there's been, there, there was a case in Texas a couple of years ago where someone, uh, you know, horribly shot up a church and killed you know, more than 20 people. And then uh, I believe he killed himself afterwards. And he was found to have cannabis in his blood at the time of the shooting. Um, all of it. I mean, so, so that is to say, I think, I think collecting that data would be useful, but I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to tell us um, anything definitive one way or the other. Interesting. And you know what? I was really amazed, you know, tracking down that story that you were able to see the original story where they edited out that the shooter um, uh, was angry at his grandmother for not letting him yes. smoke weed. How did you find that? How did, how are you able to, are you like, so, scanning so I the read news the story and, and it was in there and you know, I'm, I, I mean, I will say that in cases of whether when it's sort of either a mass shooting or some kind of extreme violence, I'm very attuned to this. And very, frankly, it's more it comes up more often when it's this sort of horrible, uh, you know, intimate partner violence where there's, you know, somebody gets stabbed 100 times or decapitated or, you know, when, when there's when there's when there's terrible intimate partner violence, it's stunning how often cannabis is referenced at some point in, you know, in, you know, in the perpetrator's history. Um, and again, correlation is not causation, but it is still stunning. Uh, but in that case, I was waiting for some reference to, to, to the shooter's cannabis use. Um, and lo and behold, I saw it. And the reference was, you know, this, 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 uh, a coworker of his at the fast food restaurant where he'd worked said, you know, his grandmother and mother had, had criticized him, um, for smoking weed or had tried to stop him from smoking. And so I thought to myself, oh, you know, we're going to see a whole bunch of stories about his cannabis use. And then a few hours later, I mean, so I posted that actually on my Substack because I don't have Twitter anymore, but I have a Substack account. Um, my, my page is called Unreported Truths, and you can sign up for it. And mostly, nearly all the content is free. I'll just say that. Um, we could talk more about Substack and Twitter later. But so I posted this. And, and, you know, within a few hours, I have a large Substack following. People were emailing me and saying, I can't find this. You know, essentially, like, did you make this up? Well, I knew I didn't make it up. So I went back to the Times and it was gone. They had edited this reference to, uh, you know, to Salvador Ramos smoking cannabis out or, or being criticized by his grandmother for smoking out of the story. And I thought to myself, that is just very strange. And so I put that, that new edit online and that's where, uh, you know, Fox and other people picked up on it because once there's a you know this this idea that you know mainstream media outlets are censoring information they don't like that immediately gets traction yeah interesting so uh devin your fan um uh, wants to start a national candy ban um of <laughs> cannabis and i agree with him that the world does not need cannabis infused skittles starbucks lifesavers or weedos <laughs> that look like cheetos um those people that just gives me more business as an emergency physician um what do you think 
Uh, I mean, I think that's probably a good idea. I think there's a lot of risk of, uh, you know, of gummies, uh, especially gummies. Um, and in fact, there's a terrible case in Pennsylvania a few days ago, or I would say a few weeks ago, where um, uh, I believe a four-month-old, I, I, I have to go back and look, um, overdosed and died um, following, uh, you know, ingestion of some THC laden gummies and the, the mother's been arrested and she said she thought they were cbd which who knows whether or not that's true but it, you know it's a terrible case but if you know whenever you have sweets especially especially gummies um there's a real risk of kids taking them and you well, know and frankly we know that the baby could health. have died from cbd too uh I, I i suppose that's true i mean um but you know it's not it's certainly not the only case of a thc overdose for a for a young child I, you know the cannabis advocates say, or I, I guess they've stopped saying that, you know, THC and cannabis have never killed anybody, but that's clearly untrue. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think I'd favor that. Now, the industry is going to scream about it and say adults have the right to consume however they like. I mean, especially given there's this other issue around edibles, this broader issue around edibles and dosing and titration and, you know, the joke being you take an edible, nothing happens. An hour later, you take another one, nothing happens. An hour later, you take another one. And then half an hour after that, you're in the emergency room being treated by you. Um, you know, I, I think there's good reason to, to wonder whether it's such a good idea to encourage uh, edibles. But um, certainly the, you know, the candy uh, formulation is problematic. Yeah. So I want to talk about mental health. Your wife is a forensic psychiatrist um, and inspired your your research on uh, cannabis. I think it's a bipartisan issue in support uh, on mental health, especially pediatric mental health. Um, we're now holding patients in the emergency department for days. Patients are living in the ER more than I work in the ER, yeah. um, and which is really sad, especially for kids. Uh, in your research, and you researched a lot on mental health as well, um, is the issue increased volume, decreased capacity, or both? Um, so that's a really good question. I think it's mainly increased volume. I mean, if you're talking about ER weights and lack of psychiatric, you know, a space, especially for sort of pediatric and teen psychiatric beds, um, you know, I mean... I haven't actually heard from parents in the last couple of months, but certainly during COVID. I mean, I was hearing from parents who, you know, who couldn't find a, and these are, you know, these are obviously, these are wealthy, committed parents who have resources, who couldn't find beds for their kids in multiple states. Um, and, you know, and there's considerable data showing more ER visits, more sort of quasi-suicide attempts. Suicides themselves are not way up, as you know. Um, but but drug overdose deaths are way up, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish. And you know, traffic accidents are way up, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish that from suicide. Um, but uh, but uh, in, I think I think there's generally strain on the mental health system in the United States right now. Um, and how we fix that, I don't know. But uh, but sir, you know, the the, the input of you know, a lot of kids or young adults using really high strength cannabis and winding up in the ER, um, you know, again, as you said, for days at times until they can, until they're manageable is problematic. Um, I, I just yesterday got an email from somebody, uh, a woman in Southern California, whose, uh, whose brother, and he's in his late twenties, um, had his first psychotic break about two years ago and uh, was diagnosed with schizophrenia and moved back uh, from the state where he'd been back home and uh, was a very heavy cannabis user, no previous mental health issues, but had been using for a long time and uh, uh, stopped using when he went back home, has started using again and appears to be spiraling both into psychosis and potentially into violence. This person who's never been violent um, is now showing signs of violence toward uh, towards animals is now threatening his mother. It, it actually sounds quite, uh, you know, quite worrisome. And, and, you know, there's nothing, there's really nothing because he hasn't actually done anything yet. There's nothing that anybody can do. Um, uh, and, and he's continuing to use, he stopped working again. And, you know, and this, and this woman said to me, she said, I don't understand. Like I, you're talking about this, I read, you know, I, I saw a podcast you were on a couple of years ago, but why, like, 
why isn't this being acknowledged? And, um, you know, I said, look, mainly we talked about, you know, her brother and what she might be able to do or what the family might be able to do, which, you know, as you know, their options are quite limited. But um, I said, look, the industry and the nonprofit, you know, industry pushing legalization, but, but more importantly, the culture, uh, uh, you know, is so pro-cannabis that these, that these stories are not, it, they're being told, but they're sort of being laughed at or sloughed off or called one-offs. And especially in a place like Southern California, I, you know, I said to her, look, you know, you, you know, I'm sure you know people who um, they use too much. They wind up really paranoid. Uh, they wind up, you know, thinking, oh, my neighbor's out to get me or something. They wind up in the ER and it gets laughed off as a bad trip. And, you know, you multiply that times a thousand. That's where we are right now. And people like this, this woman's brother uh, you know, who are really seriously so sliding into permanent or quasi-permanent psychosis and, you know, and risking violence, um, their cases are just being ignored. Yeah. And, and you, I think it was the, that data was in, in your book, you know, the, the European data that says if they didn't have high dose THC, there, there would be less schizophrenia in London and Amsterdam and, and, well, I mean, and Paris. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a controversial... Uh, you know, I, I would say it's still controversial, but I, I think it's getting less controversial because the data is just getting stronger. And unfortunately, in the U.S., as you know, we don't have any real data about schizophrenia incidents uh, or, or even really the number of people who get who get, uh, you know, who get uh, put uh, put away for a month for, you know, for psychosis treatment. It's not it's not collected on a national basis in any good way. Yeah. It's a problem. You know, I'm, I'm in Southern California and, uh, you know, really wanted to do something uh, legislatively to make people aware. So we sponsored SB 1097, the Cannabis Right to Know Act. And all it would ask for is labels, warning labels. Okay, we thought, okay, the, the, we have. If you go see Star Wars, right, there's going to be a warning <laughs> that right. you know the lights are, can give you a seizure, right? right? So we're not asking for something heroic, and the cannabis industry is so strong. And I don't know if the politicians are so paid off, um, but they just say no, we're not going to. It's not going to pass committee. It, we've so, passed so the Senate. I, I, we've miraculously passed the Senate. The hearing next week is with the Assembly, and they said, "Nah, we don't. We want it in advertisements on billboards. We want it um, in social media. We don't want to put any warning labels in social media and billboards. Not on the product. And maybe they'll give us a brochure to hand out uh, that people will throw away at the cannabis store." I, I was going to say. So I, I was aware that there was this legislation. So so. So it so it's gonna it's gonna die in the California Assembly. I don't know. We're we're debate. It's gonna be heard next week, and there's negotiations behind closed doors right now. And I'm almost wanting it to just to die, so the world would know that California legislators prefer to protect the cannabis industry over and the people who are sponsoring the bill are the ER doctors, the California Medical Associations, the OBGYNs, the pediatricians, and the parents have been harmed. That's the voice who wants warning labels. It's just not even asking that much. Right. We're not asking for potency limits or anything like right. that. Just, you know, have your billboards, just have a warning on it. Um, and and the, the industry is so strong that they're like, nah, we don't want to. I, I will say, you know, I was in California a, a couple months ago um, and, and, you know, I, I'd been in San Francisco in 2018, uh, just following legalization um, or a few a few months, you know, I, I, after, I guess, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the non-medical, the retail dispensaries started to open and there were a tremendous number of ads and it really felt like a big push and Southern California to L.A. too. And the mo when I was there a couple of months ago, uh, I didn't see as many ads. I didn't see, it didn't feel like it was exactly part of the zeitgeist the same way. And I wonder whether the legal industry, um, you know, has, really has, has found itself unable to compete with the unregulated industry and is pulling in its horns in terms of advertising and um, and I also wonder, and th this is a theory that they're I have. Getting, that, they're uh, getting, the governor's giving them tax breaks. Oh, God. So they, just, they're, they are getting tax breaks so they can compete with the legal market. And, of the, course, with the pandemic, they were declared an essential public service. 
So it, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's probably only a matter of time before they start asking for direct handouts and not just tax breaks. Uh, I, I do think, and I've seen some data just recently about this. You know, I, you know who Keith Humphreys is, of course. Um, but, uh, but, you know, he's so smart and he's so, uh, you know, he's so sort of data driven. He posted something a few days ago, which um, kind of confirms something that, that's, uh, that's in Tell Your Children and I think has even been more true in the last couple of years. And frankly, I think is a big problem both for the industry and for sort of the broader legalization movement if it continues. And that is this, uh, Dr. Love. You know, we know about alcohol. Alcohol certainly, you know, can be a dangerous drug for a lot of people, but there's a large number of people who use it casually, don't have problems with it, and they sort of provide cover for the industry. And I think that there was this hope among cannabis uh, activists and the industry that when cannabis was legalized, the same thing would happen, that there would be, you know, all these people who use cannabis casually in college or whatever would come back to it and become, you know, once a month users. And they would provide cover for that, you know, group of hardcore users who obviously provide most of the industry's revenue. And, and it doesn't look like that's happening, actually. It looks like the number of casual users is not increasing that much, but the number of people who use really heavily has gone through the roof. And my theory on this is sort of twofold. First of all, we know cannabis is addictive and high potency cannabis is probably more addictive. At the same time, if you're not a heavy user, I think the sort of 20% THC flower cannabis, much less edibles or vaping, is it, it, I think it's unpleasant for a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, people, it's it's a turnoff. It's like, That's whoa, right. this you, is you not what up, I use. Like, like sitting, staring at the wall for three hours, you know, if you're not in the ER. And so the industry has not become this broad cultural phenomenon since legalization, it's actually kind of gone the other way. It's become, yes, it's a its a relatively large group compared to, let's say, heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine, but it's become even more centered on that group of addicts and heavy users. And frankly, if I were in the industry, that would scare me a lot because it means there's not people who are out there who are like, you know what, I like this once a month or, you know, or even once a week. I'm going to protect, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be, you know, made illegal again because I want to be able to go to the dispensary and buy it once in a while. If you don't have those people, you have a problem as a, as a drug industry, if that makes sense, I think. Yeah. I, I'm almost at the, I mean, I, I, again, not to criminalize people. I want, a, I want an informed public. Right. I want to inform like people who use tobacco know what they're taking. People who drink alcohol know what they're taking. People who use marijuana don't. Yep. Uh, and there's no quality control. Um, you know, so we're almost better off making it federally legal so there could be those controls. <laughs> yeah, I I I I I guess I don't agree. I, I think I, I did think, you know, three when Tell Your Children came out, again, that was 2019, it seemed to me that there was going to be national legalization. That was just going to happen. I'm not so convinced of that. Now. First of all, Joe Biden clearly doesn't uh, favor that. And second of all, the Republicans, it looks like, are going to you know, have a real chokehold on the House and Senate after uh, November. And third of all, you know, th there have been these problems with legalization just from sort of a tax revenue point of view. It hasn't generated that much money. But maybe the most important thing is there have been problems Right. If you look at a, a you know a city like Portland, Oregon, uh, you know a city like Denver, crime is way way up since those places legalized. And yes, I'm not going to say it is all because of cannabis, but this idea that we're going to legalize this and it's going to be good for public safety has very very clearly not been the case. And and, and public and, and, health, right? and, and driving deaths are way up too, by the way. Right. And also, I could tell you have like following every single patient who uses fentanyl and all the deaths of fentanyl. I, I haven't met a single person, not one, who accidentally or on purpose or whatever you, uses fentanyl and ended up in the hospital that didn't start their journey in life um, to drugs with without marijuana. Not one. They yeah. all. People go, oh, tobacco, alcohol. No. Any fentanyl user started out with marijuana. Now, not every marijuana user ends of up being course. a fentanyl user. But I would say, you know, 99% of fentanyl users started out with marijuana. 
That's interesting. I, I, you know, I, it certainly is potent, you know, the, the, the current, the stuff that's being used today. Right. That's, that's why I feel like, well, you know, I don't know what your views are. So what is public health protection? You mentioned public safety. What about public health? Uh, you know, I, I get, you know, I say and tell your children that I think decriminalization is sort of the right balance to strike. You do not want this legalized industry pushing this. Um, I guess I'm still there. Uh, um, I also think this idea that, you know, we should spend a lot of money on educating people is a good idea. Uh, I think I think you're right about that. Um uh, you know, we're not, we're not, I don't think we're going to go back to a place where you can be arrested and thrown in jail for having a joint. Um, uh, you know, that, that's not where the country is. And so, uh, you know, the, the, we should try to mitigate the harm. Oh, the, right. I, I would say, also pro- this, I would say protect the brain, protect the brain. You know, you know, I would say we need to have an honest conversation about the fact that this is not medicine. I mean, that, that, you know, this person who this, this, this woman was talking about, you know, about her brother yesterday, I said, you know, does he, does he have a medical marijuana card? And she said, yes, he has Crohn's disease and he's been using, uh, you know, for that for a long time. And so, look, there's no evidence that cannabis helps Crohn's disease. It doesn't. It hurts. It hurts your GI tract. It harms it. Yeah. Some, you know, I talk to, I, I see marijuana poisoning every single day, every single shift, multiple times. And I talk to patients about it. Sometimes they're ready to hear. I had like a young kid and I, sh- I just say, you know, I ask permission. Is it okay if I give you, you know, my little spiel on marijuana? And they'll say, yeah, you know, I'm like, okay, what do you got to say? And <laughs> I'll say, you know, you know, you're, you're vaping, you're only 21 years old. It, it's not good for your lungs. And your chance of addiction is you know, seven times higher than than for me. And it's probably not so, you know, you want to, you're still growing. You want to fill your brain with good stuff. And then I'll ask them, you know, well, what did you think of that? (laughs) Um, And the guy will say, yeah, it's okay. Maybe I'll even (laughs) stop. And then I'll have patients who, you know, my guy (laughs) the other day, he has schizophrenia. He has horrible abdominal pain. And I'll say, this is, you know, not recommended THC, I'm, you know, he's a multiple using multiple day, times a day is not recommended for someone with schizophrenia. It hurts your brain. No, no, no. My psychiatrist tells me I have a medical card. I, I can show it to you. I need it. And it's like, but that's not even the point. He's got cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. That's why he has abdominal pain. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, it, you know, and there's nothing I'm going to say to convince him. Right. No. And I think, I mean, I think there's, um, you know, look, if, you, if you're getting through to one person a week, That'd be pretty amazing. You know, people, people hear what they want to hear. And especially with this drug, it's, um, it's very striking, you know, and I, and I mentioned this and tell your children, you know, somebody who wakes up, you know, in the morning and needs a, you know, needs a hit of vodka to sort of start the day. They're not telling the world that, right? Like, you know, that, that we call that person an alcoholic and, you know, people, there's plenty of people like that, but they have shame about it. And they, and they generally don't broadcast it to the world. People who with and you know certainly with drugs like heroin or cocaine you know for the most part people try to hide their use certainly when it becomes heavy. Um, with cannabis, there's this there's this culture of oh you know I use all the time and I'm so proud of myself I can you know uh, look at this bong hit I just ripped and you know I'm putting it on YouTube and and uh, you know I wake and bake and it, there there is a there's this cultural Ask how much do you um, use they'll say as much as I can that's right and people will use insane amount you know they'll use a gram of THC a day I mean I, it, it's so it's so odd that it's become this you know this sort of positive thing for these people yeah, interesting so health misinformation a serious threat to public health uh, Surgeon General Murphy says what do you think Health misinformation. Uh, well, look, I mean, now, now we're sort of going. In. I, I think, I think, I don't think anyone in the government should be defining misinformation. Okay, I don't think I, I, I don't information that you don't like. You know, whether it's about COVID or about cannabis or about whatever, it's not misinformation. Okay, in the there's a the, the in the United States, we've we've done very well for a long time by encouraging people to debate and by having lots of points of view. And, and I understand that social media is problematic and it can amplify, um, you know, it can amplify sort of the loudest or worst voices. But I guess I'm of an age where I still believe 
that the solution to bad speech is more speech, and that I don't think the government should be involved in, in, in this in any way. I think you make your case, the other side makes its case, and you know, and hopefully you'll you'll convince people. Um, uh, but you know, I I am banned from Twitter, as as you know. Um, and I was banned for uh, uh, my fifth and you know my fifth strike from Twitter. My final strike was for a tweet that began, and this is about the vaccines. It doesn't stop infection or transmission. Now that was in August of last year. I don't think there's anybody in the world who would dispute the truth of those two sentences right now. So, um, so you know, Twitter. Look, Twitter's a private platform. They have the, you know, they, 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 they claim the right to sort of have whoever on they want. There's various legal issues that came up, you know, that, that I've now sued them about. Um, I don't, you know, I can't really go into the details of too much of what's happened. Obviously, my lawsuit is continuing. Um, but, but I don't believe that anybody in the government or really in the media should be talking about misinformation or doing quote unquote fact checking, except in the most basic way. Okay, so so if I say you know the United States has two billion people, that fact uh, is untrue. Okay, and so and so you can fact check that. But if I say you know um, uh, you know capitalism has been good for the United States, I I'm just I'm just trying to make something. Up. And you say you know capitalism has been proven to increase inequality and therefore your statement is factually untrue we're just having a debate and you don't get to say whether you work for the associated press or reuters uh you're just expressing an opinion the same as my opinion and like for you to claim that you're fact checking me under those circumstances is nonsense and for you to claim that i'm spouting misinformation is nonsense and so um, you know, I, I think there should be a lot less sort of getting on the high horse uh, from the from places like the New York Times, where I used to work, or from these social media companies. I think I think in general, people should be allowed to and encouraged to debate, and that's especially true on Twitter. Facebook is more complicated because Facebook has these algorithms that sort of, you know, they promote stuff and they hide stuff, and but but Twitter is, you know, at least in theory was and is more of a truly open platform. And it's, you know, and it's a problem that they've gone away from that, in my opinion. Interesting. Um, what I was thinking is if you're going to say we want, you know, follow the science, um, you know, the health misinformation, it can't just apply to COVID, right? It has to apply to marijuana too. <laughs> it's like you can't like follow the science and go with the government, you know, um, uh, information on the vaccine and COVID and completely ignore the in misinformation out there on how CBD and THC cures everything from cancer to, to pain and everything else. Now, no, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that those statements are, you know, are false. I think they're provably false. Um, you know, but all from my point of view, what I did in Tell Your Turn was make the case as best I could. And, you know, the, uh, look, people, maybe I'm sensitive about this because people said that book was misinformation. And I was sort of saying, no, you're misinformation. And, I'm, and to me, I actually, I think it was a sub stack I wrote a few months ago. It's what I call the Spider-Man effect. You know that famous, um, there's a famous uh, uh, meme, a famous cartoon, and it's three Spider-Mans pointing at each other. Like, I'm the real Spider-Man, I'm the real Spider-Man, I'm the real Spider-Man. Um, and whenever you're in that situation where both sides are claiming the other side is lying, I don't really think there's a place for the government or a platform like Twitter to get involved. So, so I mean, I actually once asked my wife this. I'm sure you, you may have seen this too. What do you do in a situation on the psychiatric ward where you have two people who both say they're Jesus, right? And she said, well, they sort of work it out. Um, but, you know, when you, when you have... When you have a situation where both sides are saying the other side is lying, um, I think the best thing to do is just to let both sides pre present their case and avoid avoid trying uh, to, to arbitrate well, it, it, too much, if that makes also sense. Also, it, it creates more paranoia. So I had a patient who came in 
and to the emergency department. He's very anxious. He had this long list of symptoms. He go and he tells me, you know, and I put it on Instagram. Um, but then um, because he thought his symptoms were due to the vaccine, and he got banned from from Instagram. But he saved it. I said, well, let me let me look at your thing, and he showed me what he wrote. Whole litany of you know, <laughs> ranting symptoms. He had cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, right? He didn't have any reaction from COVID, but it just made him more paranoid. Like That's if you, right. by cutting him off, you didn't help the guy. That's right. Um, and and yeah. by the way, I told myself I wasn't going to talk vaccines with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it'd be hard, but I, here I am going to do it anyway. But I have to ask you, are you vaccinated? Did you? I, I am, I'm, well, I'm vaccinated against other things. I'm not vaccinated against COVID. My wife is not vaccinated against COVID. Our children are not vaccinated against COVID. Um, I, I'm, sorry. No, no, I just, I, I know people, in, and maybe Twitter and, and the mainstream media makes it seem like it's a political thing, but I could tell you that I ask every single patient now for two years, or a little less than two years, um, you know, do you have a vaccine? Do you want the vaccine? And it's not political. The people who don't want the vaccine are, are not like Republicans or Democrats or whites or blacks. It's, it's a mixture of people who are um, probably paranoid of, of, of government or big pharma, but it, it's the political, it's not a political divide in real life. I, it's a political divide in the, in the media, but in real life down on the ground where people live, it, it, I don't think it is. I, I, look, if I thought the vaccine uh, would be helpful for me or my family, uh, I would take it. I, I don't, I mean, first of all, I think I'm at very, very low risk from COVID. I'm, you know, I'm a healthy, you know, person under 50. Uh, certainly my children are at negligible risk. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, I think, and also if this were sort of a traditional inactivated virus vaccine, I think, you know, like, uh, would I, would I run out and get it? No, but would I have a big problem with it? No, I would not. I think, I think people misunderstand how radical these mRNA vaccines are and how little research was done on them before COVID that, um, you know, because uh, I'm writing something about this today. So I was looking up Moderna, you know, Moderna is the lead really vaccine company uh, dealing with mRNA vaccines. There, as of the beginning of 2020, they had tested all their mRNA therapeutics on few, on I think fewer than 1500 people. OK, and they were nowhere near having a product that could even get to a clinical trial. Now, they it may, it may have been more than 1500. It was in the 1500 range. OK, so so we went from that, uh, Dr. Lev, to vaccinating a billion people with this product in a year. And I think that should scare anybody who knows anything about science and medicine. And even if the vaccines had worked perfectly, I think that would have been a mistake. Now, it's abundantly clear at this point that they don't work perfectly. If they did, you know, Anthony Fauci would not be announcing he has COVID. Um, and if they did, frankly, uh, we'd have no more COVID or, you know, basically no more COVID. Right. Instead, well, the, we have, the virus did change. COVID. I do have to tell my audience that I am vaccinated times three. I am times three. I'm a total germaphobe. I'm still like wearing masks and washing my hands. And, but. and, and I must ask, have you gotten uh, COVID? Or have you gotten an Omicron? No, 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 no. Oh, good if, for you. If, if I get COVID, you know, then the nobody way. is you safe know. because I, I'm a real germaphobe, right? I, I was like wearing, I was went to the ER ready to die for my country, um, <laughs> dressed up in an astronaut suit in the ER. You know, I figured that's my mission in life. Um, and it... I, I think some of it is now for me is irrational. Like I don't have to be as scared and I know that the virus isn't killing. It's a different virus now, right? Yes, it's a different virus. It's a different virus now. It's not killing people. I don't see people dying from it, but I, I still have to like wash my hands and, you know. Do you, yeah. Now, a uh, serious question for you. Are you wearing a mask as you're talking to your, your patients? I wear two masks. You do, do, you, do you find that that in any way sort of impedes your communication with them or they don't trust you as much. Some of them perhaps. Yeah, you, you I'm know. sure. I'm sure that happens. I had a, a, a guy who was deaf and he insisted that I take my mask off. But I mean, I, I have my rights too. like, I'm, I'm sure. not going to do that. I got him an interpreter, but I wasn't going to do that. And and being in the ER, every patient has COVID until proven otherwise. Right. You'll have <laughs> a sprained finger and then you have COVID and then I'm exposed. So I don't 
I don't, I walk into every room as if that person has COVID. Again, I'm telling you, I'm a germaphobe. So I. Have you, have you always, have you always been a bit of a germaphobe? Or? I was washing my phone and dictaphone in the ER before COVID during flu season. Um, now, now it's worse. <laughs> now it's worse. Well, I, you know, I, I, I I get it. But I, I but it, it's from experience, right? I would, I use the dictaphone. We, sh- we, you know, share telephones in the emergency room. Your partner has a cold, he coughs into it, and then I get the cold, right? right. It, it's transmitted that way. So I think I'm, I'm science-based germaphobe. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but, but just to, just to go back to the vaccines for one second, I, I do think that this, my skepticism comes broadly from my skepticism about the pharmaceutical industry, right? That, that, you know, I covered, and I did cover it for the New York Times, and I I saw, for example, what Eli Lilly did with Zyprexa, which, and I'm not saying Zyprexa is a terrible drug or kills everyone who takes it or anything like that. What I am saying is they were aware that it had these sort of severe metabolic side effects, and they, I would say, at best, tried to play that down. And, and you're talking about a drug that's, as you know better than I, being prescribed to a really, uh, a really vulnerable group of people, right? It's psychiatric patients, patients with severe mental illness. In some cases, they may be being compelled to take this drug. I think if you're Eli Lilly, you have a you have a responsibility to be as honest about the problems with that drug as as possible. And I think if you're Pfizer and you are you know are you you're selling a drug that or a vaccine that you're making billions and billions of dollars on Moderna you know same thing you have and that that again literally a billion people worldwide have now taken they should be going out of their way to to describe the risk benefit profile accurately and to my mind they did not do that I don't know. I, from my, my point of view, it was enough at the beginning with the with the killer virus when I was seeing people dying in the ER all the time and friends around me and colleagues who have died. It, you know, it was, for me, it was definitely uh, something that I recommend for myself and for people around me. Now, Understand. now I don't know. Right now, I um I don't know if the vaccine today works for the virus today. Like, have you? So you've been boosted, but you you may not get another booster. I didn't get the fourth. I'm I can get the fourth, but everyone I know in Israel who got the fourth got COVID. So what's the point? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so there's a balance there. Um, so I ha- So we did, I wasn't going to talk vaccine, but we ended up doing it. How, how could I not? Um, yes, yes. Cancel culture. You know, I, I. I feel for you for, you know, being banned. I mean, I don't know, but some people are more stoic and it's like, oh, I've been banned. So I'm cool and more famous. How do you, how do you feel? How do you deal with that? Does it hurt your feelings? Is it it, make you mad? Is it part of the deal? It doesn't hurt my feelings to be banned because, uh, I mean, I believe that what I wrote was correct and will be proven correct in the long term. Um, it is a it is frustrating to me because Twitter is a very large audience that I don't have access to anymore, and I feel that I use Twitter in a in a productive way the last couple of years. Whether or not, or you know, from the beginning of COVID until I was banned, I think I was able to raise questions and um, that were important questions, even for people who disagreed with me. Um, you know, I have a large audience on Substack, uh, but in some ways, I'm preaching in, on Substack to people who agree with me. So, you know, so that that's fine. Like, it's nice to know that I have that audience and some of those people even pay me. But, um, but the value to Twitter is you get to debate with people and you get to discuss things and hopefully, and, and, you know, hopefully you move the ball and, and that's, that that's not available to me. Anymore. Do you move the ball or do the same people talk to each other all the time? They bait each other. You're not, are you really I changing think, anybody's uh, mind? Well, I, I think you can move the ball. I mean, it's hard and there's a lot of, there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of ranting. There's a lot of circular conversations. Um, but there were times when I wrote stuff and I felt that it was being heard, um, you know, very early on pre vaccines with COVID, uh, and, you know, I guess you could argue this point either way. So in, in April of 2020, I became known essentially as the person who's saying, look, the models are wrong. The models are not accurate. And not only are they not accurate predictively, they're not accurate as to what they're describing today. 
So and the famously, there was a model that said New York is going to have 50,000 people hospitalized with COVID as of you know, April 3rd. And on April 3rd, there were 10,000 people hospitalized. And I was the one who pointed that out. I said, look, the model's just completely wrong, okay? And, and people noticed that. And people on the right certainly noticed that. And, um, you know, it didn't, did it change the tra trajectory of COVID and, and, our, and the lockdowns in any meaningful way? Probably not. But did it maybe sort of get people in a state like Florida, or, you know, or Texas uh, to push back a little bit and, and maybe remain open or reopen more quickly than they would have? Maybe. I mean, I, I don't want to overstate, even that maybe overstating whatever little influence I had, but I know that Twitter enabled me to get that fact out there, get my voice out there in a way that nothing else could have at that time. And there were people who heard. Yeah, interesting. Do you so since you brought it up? I mean, I don't consider um, vaccines or cannabis the topics that we talk to um, political in any way. I, I I feel like I have like a public health hat. Um, but do you consider yourself as I mean, as your um, point of view political? Uh, I mean, they they are right politicized topics. I'm a registered independent. Um, and, you know, one of the things on my sub stack, so my audience leans conservative, clearly. I, you know, I told myself when I started the sub stack, I'm going to say what I think, even if that cost me followers, even if that cost me money because people unsubscribe. So, for example, after, um, after the, you know, Uvalde shooting, I said, look, you know, the country, the country's sick, okay? And it's not, it's not okay that when I drop my kids off at school that, you know, that they could be shot like this. And, and I don't know, and, 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 you know, these mass shootings are getting worse. There are more of them. And, and I, you know, and, and, and I don't know what the solution is. I do believe that the second amendment is a crucial part of our, you know, freedoms as an American. I do, but, but that doesn't mean there can't be some restrictions on it. And whether that means, you know, making it harder uh, for, you know, for an 18 year old to buy, uh, you know, an AR-15 or whether that means, uh, you know, some kind of more reasonable red flag restrictions or cooling off periods or whatever it is, there should be some things we can do, even if they're not going to make a huge difference, because we have to tell our kids that we care about them. We have to show them that. And, um, and people hated that. They hated me for writing that. Um, but, you know, it's how I felt. It's how I feel. And I did promise myself that, you know, I don't care. I don't care that people on the left call me this, you know, conservative nut job, or I don't care that on some level, like I'm cutting my own throat with the people who are supporting me by writing this stuff. I've got to write what's true to me and, and not be, and not be somebody who's going to, you know, back off just because you're, you're the only ones who listen to me. You're the ones who pay my bills, but I don't agree with you on everything. And I'm going to tell you that. I relate to that. I think you just have to be true to yourself and not, you know, not follow the money. Um, I mean, I'm and, sure you're uh, pigeonholed too, right? Yeah, but I, I'll just be independent, I'll just, right? I'll just do it myself, right? I'll just have my own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can say whatever I want. I can meet with whoever I want, and if, and uh, um, I'll lobby on my own. If there you this, go. Right. <laughs> And so the bills, you know, that I that you know the cannabis, I, I just fund it on my own. Luckily, I you know. I make money as an emergency physician so then I could spend my free time doing this part because I feel like this makes a difference, right? I hope um, so. I mean, you hope, right? If you can convince one person. But you do have to have tough skin. So I admire you for that. I don't think my skin is as tough as yours, but um, but uh, uh, you have a strong heart to be able to, to take that. Well, well, thank you. I mean, at this point, I've got no choice. As, as a as I think I wrote at one point, I said, you know, my, my brand is sort of uh, tough-minded asshole cynicism. And my daughter, who is nine, said to me, is that your brand or your personality? <laughs> <laughs> Kids know how to, like, stick it to you. <laughs> so, Alex, anyway, what's your, what's your next project? Great. What's uh, your next my, project? Uh, uh, my next project? So, you know, I'm... At some point, I got to stop writing about COVID in the vaccines. I, I don't know when that point Yeah, get is. over that. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, before COVID, I wanted to write something broadly about drugs in this country, drugs in the United States, illegal drugs, and how, you know, how, what a genius job the left has done in sort of pushing decriminalization and, you know, and in some cases, full legalization, not just of and normalization, um, you know, not just of cannabis, normalization, but of commercialization, not yeah, way beyond. I mean, psychedelics and, you know, and, and, and opioids and, and it's insane. We have a, you know, we have a tremendous drug crisis in the United States. And this notion that more is the answer. Um, I mean, I think there's like, I think there's very good evidence, you know, good scientific evidence why that's not true. But I think the, I think the, you know, I think the, I think people who are fighting drug use are thinking tactically and the people who want to promote a vision of a world in which drugs are legal think strategically. And they've spent 25 years sort of saying certain, sorry, saying certain things over and over again that are untrue, certainly about cannabis, but about other drugs too. But if you say them enough times, people, people start to believe them. And so I, I think, you know, that was the book that I was going to write. Um, and I would like to come back to that, uh, you know, because, I, you know, I, yeah, I mean, the, he, here's what I would say sort of broadly and philosophically is drugs, there's a certain number of people who drugs are just going to eat, right? They're going to they're gonna become addicts and they're going to die or they're going to they're gonna destroy their families or they're going to have severe mental illness there. And we don't know who those people are going in, right? We, I mean, obviously, if you have a family history, you're more likely to become one of those people. Um, and, and frankly, once that happens, they're essentially unfixable from the outside. Now, sometimes they fix themselves, right? Sometimes they, sometimes they stop using on their own. But when you look at, at treatment programs, I mean, it's just, it's just terrible what the statistics are. I mean, that's the most disheartening thing about all of this. Is that, you know, you spend all this money trying to help people. And, and frankly, very, very little of it does but, any but, measure. But there are 20 million Americans living in recovery. Right. I mean, that but, does show hope. And, and people can stop. Absolutely. But I think they, they generally have to sort of stop for themselves. Right. You can try to help them from the outside, but they can, but, but in general, people stop on their own for whatever reason they have children they they wind up in jail the costs of using become high enough that they stop and it's you can encourage people and support people but ultimately it is a personal decision right so 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 on the one hand we don't know who's going to become really troubled by drugs on the other hand we don't really know very well how to help them although we know that a lot of them can get better. We don't really know how to help them from the outside. We, and we know that there's tremendous societal consequences to drug use, not just for the user, but for the people around him or her. Okay, you put all that together, and I think you have a coherent argument for why drug use should be strongly discouraged by the government and by society, up to and including incarceration in many cases. Now, that's not a popular position right now. And, 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 and I understand that. But what I'm saying is there's a philosophical case to be made here that isn't being made. And that's the book that I thought should be written. Um, not, you know, not about one drug, not about one treatment modality, but let's sort of look at from the 50,000 foot level at why society has the right and the obligation to discourage drug use. And I think, I think there's a case there and I don't think it gets made very often. Yeah. That's does that, a good, does that make sense? Yeah. That's a big picture. Um, the whole issue of normalization of, of drug use, um, the whole issue of stigma, right? We, we don't want stigma on the user, but we still want stigma stigma to the use. We don't want kids to use drugs. Right. Right? I think so, stigma is okay. I think you maybe do want to stigmatize it's, it's, it's a tool for prevention. We have we have stigma, don't cross the street when the, the light is red and right. and don't smoke cigarette when you're, you know, as a kid we tell, ooh, you know, that person, you know, smoking, that's kind of gross. That he has a that person has a problem. They're not a bad person. 
But you know, you look you how successful you... that camp those campaigns have been stigmatizing. We've stigmatized domestic violence. We've stigmatized drinking and driving, and you know those those campaigns have had positive effects. Um, so so anyway, well, that, that's I think the, that that'll that. be a, a good book. I I will buy it. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to Devin Versace um, for yes. your question. And good luck, Devin, on your cannabis candy ban. Yes, children do not need cannabis weedos. And actually, the number one drug um, found in poisoning in children under the age of five is THC. Ask any pediatric emergency department. And they'll tell you we do have to protect at least our children. And Alex Berenson, it's been a pleasure. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you for this conversation, your novels, and being a brave speaker. The world <laughs> is not black and white. Um, we do have to look at the data, acknowledge it. It's okay if we don't agree. And Yes, and, and I'm a germaphobe and, I, and, I, and you're uh, not. You know, I thank you. And, um, you know, look, it's easy for me. All I have to do is talk. You actually have to, you know, get in there and, and treat these folks and deal with the consequences. And that, I mean, that's a whole, that is a whole nother level. And, uh, and you know, I appreciate that. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor. A sincere and warm thank you to Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis, doctors educating on the harms of marijuana. Visit isaacone.org, I-A-S-I-C-1.org to view their medical library translated for public understanding, listen to their speaker series, and follow the science. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davey Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths. Thank you.